Hey, it's Richard Bay here. And if you're in shock looking at this thinking, oh my God, I haven't seen this guy in years. Look at how he's aged and changed. Well, that's just the way I feel every morning when I look in the mirror. There's probably no better way to reintroduce yourself uh, to those who have already known you on television than what Jack Parr did. He was fired from the air for saying a terrible word. Yeah, they had cancel culture back then. You know what word he said? He said WC for toilet. It means water closet. The British use it mostly. And they took him off the air for using that language. And when he returned, he said, uh, they eventually hired him back, I guess a couple of weeks later. And he said, as I was saying before I was interrupted. So as I was saying before I was interrupted, um, we're starting something here. Uh, a podcast, and over the years, people have said to me, gee, why aren't you on somewhere? I, I enjoyed listening to you so much, and, uh, you know, you should be doing a podcast. A, a little late in the game, <laughs> everybody and his brother and his kids and his dog have a podcast now, uh, and this is a video cast, uh, of course. Uh, my background was in video as well as in radio, and one of my producers from Sirius XM, a guy named Albert Reynoso, there he is. <laughs> he is a Latin X, because you shouldn't be saying Latin X for people. I mean, X is how you say X in Spanish. Why do they? Why do they want to anglicize the word Latin? I really don't understand. I think the whole thing is ridiculous anyway. But he's my. Uh, his father was from Peru, and he has been, well, gently suggesting to me that we get together and do a video podcast, correct? Yes, that's correct. You're doing a great job. All right. So far. So far. Um, because I, you know, I, I've done radio interviews, and I've been on the radio for a while, but this is something very new to me. Uh, but Alberto Arenoso has pledged to help Ricardo Montalbay on this Latin X uh, video podcast. That's right. So possibly, and, and let me just tell you something, it's going to be live every week, Monday at uh, five o'clock. And it's going to Eastern. be on Eastern time. And it's going to, so if you're in California and I have lots of friends in California, it'll be on at three o'clock and you'll be able to contribute to it, ask questions. There's a, a, a box on the side of the screen where you can type in either questions. And I'm not asking you to agree with me on anything. I never have. I'm not asking you to, uh, I don't know, I, you know, I, 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 to think what I think. I'm just asking you to think. And what I've tried to do over the years is present something that isn't available in a lot of different places. Now, I know podcasts and video casts are like rabbits. They keep popping up and propagating every way you turn. And there's TikTok and there's, I don't know, there's a Chinese version of it or something. But, you know, I, I want to... I want to share with you some of my thoughts that might be different that you might not see on the mainstream media. And I don't mean like Joe Rogan style. I'm going to be here going, yeah, it's a conspiracy. The vaccines, they're, they're putting microchips into our bodies. Not that sort of thing. I want to provoke you to think about things in a different way, to notice things that we generally don't notice. And that's what I'm going to be doing every week, hopefully. Uh, for all of you here. Now, there may be some people watching this who say, Richard Bay, who the hell is Richard Bay? So I'm going to give you a bit of my background information. A lot of you already know this, uh, if you've heard me interviewed over the years, or even, you know, watched me on the show mentioning different things. But uh, I grew up a New York kid in Queens, just like our... Um, previous president, not, not too far away. I was in Far Rockaway, uh, which is a peninsula on the bottom of, uh, of the screen. At one time, uh, I had Curtis Lewa on the show, and I told, you know, he was talking about how he was a kid of the streets and a tough guy. And I said, well, I grew up in Far Rockaway. And he goes, Far Rockaway? 
You got a beach. That's not a tough area. But I did grow up there. I went to Far Rockaway High School amongst our noted alumni, our oh, Dr. Joyce Brothers. Um, oh, who's that guy? Richard Heineman, I believe, uh, went there. And Bernie Madoff. And um, the guy that stole all my money in 2009. Or didn't steal it, but lost it all. So if you go to Wikipedia and you go to Far Rockaway High School, they will have a roster of all the famous and infamous graduates of the school. And uh, well, because it's alphabetical, <laughs> not because of importance, I am at the top of the list. So uh, when I left uh, uh, New York, I began going to college. Well, first of all, summer sessions, I went to University of New Hampshire. Then I went to uh, University of California at Santa Barbara and then Berkeley and then back to Santa Barbara and then Stanford. And uh, finally, it all came to an end when I went to the Yale School of Drama in New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, I'd always wanted to be an actor uh, ever since I was at a very young age. Um, and the eye doctor who examined me said, uh, well, you know, you'll be able to lead a normal life. But with your vision, you won't be able to be a pilot. I wanted to be a pilot. My father was a, a pilot in World War II. And I said, will I be able to shoot a gun like James Bond? And he said, uh, he said, well, I mean, you could wear glasses, but you're never going to be a sharpshooter. And I started to think, and I said, well, James Bond, that's an actor in a movie. Pilots. Most of them I know because I've watched old World War II films, uh, 12 o'clock high. And, uh, I said, well, maybe I should be an actor. And I, you know what? I was only about, what, eight years old. I had had an operation on my eyes when I was five. They're still pretty bad. I have contacts in right now. And uh, so I always wanted to be an actor. And in high school, I was uh, the president of the drama club. I played the leads in all of the shows in Far Rockaway High School, Mortimer and Arsenic and Old Lace, The Rainmaker, the stage manager in our town. The name of our town is Grover's Quarters, just over the state line from Massachusetts. Of course, I had a New Hampshire accent or what I thought was one back then. And so I went to college. I went to Yale, which had a three-year MFA program among so many other talented people. I mean, Meryl Streep was there, Sigourney Weaver, Tony Shalhoub, Mark Lynn Baker, Wendy Wasserstein, a playwright. Uh, Paul Rudnick was undergrad. Uh, oh, Ted Talley wrote a play as a student, and he went on to write Silence of the Lambs. And after that, after I graduated, after three years, I was hired to be in the repertory company, and then uh, that was a great privilege because coming out of school, I started to get a twitch in my eye. I, I, I had hemorrhoids for the first time in my life, and every day I was thinking, oh my God, what have I done? Who is going to pay me to be an actor? Why didn't I go to law school like my father wanted? Why didn't I sneak? They'd always say to me and my parents, why don't you just sneak over to the law school and take some courses there? I said, Dad, it, it doesn't work like that. Although I did take undergraduate courses while I was there. But fortunately, I was saved, you know, from that pit of anxiety when the dean of the school offered me a position in the repertory company. And I was an actor, uh, you know, I guess moderately successful. I worked with so many of the new playwrights. I did Broadway. I understudied the National Theater of Great Britain on Broadway. I did Off-Broadway. I was on tours. I did regional theater. I was at the Kennedy Center. But there was no money in it. At that time, even when I was on Broadway, the Broadway scale was three fifty-five dollars a week. At $355. At one point, I was doing two plays at once. And I thought I was in heaven. I was uh, at Playwrights Horizons and I was at the Phoenix Theater. And I made about, I don't know, six, seven hundred dollars a week. And it seemed like heaven to me. But when I turned 29, I did something that I said I would never do. I borrowed a thousand dollars from my father and I, I went to L.A. 
thinking, oh, I'll, I'll get a series. I'd been flown to L.A. for sitcoms five times. Uh, and they have something called a test deal where they you negotiate the contract 15 grand a week. Well, four of them never got made. They were, And I was not shot in it because when they have a test deal, they usually make it with three different actors. And then at the last minute, they pick the one they want so you won't hold them up on salary. Um, but I was there. I landed in L.A. and I got a plane, a, a, a play as soon as I landed. Jim Lapine called me up about three days later, and I had done one of his plays. You know, Jim Lapine, who wrote and directed Into the Woods, and he's done a lot of work with Sondheim. His latest play was uh, Flying Over Sunset, which I saw in New York and I thought was fabulous, even though the reviews were not very kind. So Jim Lapine calls me and says, hey, I'm doing table settings in L.A. Would you like to do table settings? So I end up in L.A. doing a play for uh, six to eight months. And I come back to New York and I'm dead broke. Not only am I dead broke, I owe a thousand dollars to my father. So I did something else I had pledged never to do. I took a straight job in a building called the Fisk Building on 57th Street, working for the Lewis Harris Poll. And I will never forget it. I had to call farmers in the Midwest asking them what kind of uh, insecticide they use to kill weevils. Did they like Mopac? What was the other one? It was Gopac. No, Gopac is politics. Mopac or something else. And I, you know, I'm still looking for an acting job. And there was one guy there who wanted to be a playwright. And he, one day we had a big celebration because he'd been there for two years and they were bumping him up to a supervisory position over all the people on the telephones. And I thought, oh my God, am I going to be here for two years? And I remember literally on the verge of tears going, God, is this what you want for me? I'm going to be in the theater. I'm going to work with talented people, people that I love. I'm going to be doing interesting new plays and, and great classics that have survived the centuries. But I'm, I'm going to be broke all my life. And then, of course, I don't really believe this. He answered. I had had a girlfriend in California who was just a lovely person who was an actress. Her name was Forbesy Russell. And she had an audition for WCBS for a new show called Two on the Town. And she said, hey, come in with me and we'll audition together. And we'll do this as a couple. We'll be the hosts of the show. We'll do all these amazing things they're promoting on the show. And, uh, you know, we'll be a couple. We already have a relationship. And I said, ah, who's going to hire me? I don't. I have one suit to my name. I'm not a journalist. I, and she said, come on, it'll be fun. So I came in, I auditioned, I got it. She didn't. Uh, the relationship didn't survive much longer. And that's how my TV experience began. I didn't know anything about TV. So people over the years have said to me, how do you get into TV? What did you do? I mean, what, you know, how, what's the best way to start? I say the best way to start is to have a lovely girlfriend who brings you to the audition. Because that's how I started. I don't know anything else. Then after that, uh, after a year, uh, I got offered a job hosting a soap show called Soap World, where I interviewed soap opera actors, who were all actors, and we all knew the same people. And that was kind of fun, but, you know, really not all that interesting. And then... I had a friend who was working in Philadelphia, the host of Evening Magazine, Nancy Glass, and she said they're looking for someone to replace Maury Povich. Maury Povich is being let go at KYW-TV. Why don't you go down there and audition? It's a live morning show, five days a week. And I said, well, I'm, you know, it's an hour long, and I've, I've, I've never done hour-long live interviews. And she said, come on. You know, you were an actor. You, you shouldn't be afraid of doing something live. 
So I went to Philadelphia and Chuck Gingold, who was the program director, who is still a friend on Facebook, he put me through the ringer. Uh, he had me come back and audition. I don't know how many times, but it was a lot. And he would always say to me, you know, Charlie Rose wanted this job. He's begging me for this job. And I'm going out on a limb and hiring you. You have no experience. I look like a kid. I mean, at some point at the end of every show, I'm going to show you clips from the past. We'll go in the way back machine and look at the Richard Bay show and two in the town, which was that first show and even Philadelphia. And I was just looking at one the other day and I said, oh, my God, I look like a little boy. A little boy sitting on this big couch interviewing everybody from Jimmy Carter to, uh, uh, who is it in Philly, uh, uh, you know, to uh, Frank Rizzo, uh, to uh, Debbie Reynolds, uh, so many celebrities. Of course, I did much later. And then in Philly, after four years, Chuck Ingold was gone. I had a new program director. He wanted to do his own thing. And I was hired in New York to do People Are Talking at WWORNC caucus. So I won't get into all the mechanics of this, but after two years, I had a very tough agent and he said to them, double this kid's salary. He's doubled your ratings more than that. We went from a zero to a four. And he said, or don't even call me back. And I said to my agent, Alfred, you don't talk to them that way. I mean, they, the program directors, think they are gods. They think they don't recognize talent. They just think, oh, I put them in front of a camera, and so I'm responsible for the success. But Alfred wouldn't listen to me. And sometime later, uh, bef the night before I was interviewing Sammy Davis Jr. for an hour live on set at WWOR, I got a phone call from a hairdresser in Philadelphia who had cut the hair of one of the executives. And she told me, you're being replaced with Matt Lauer. And I said, I, I am. I don't know anything about this. And she said, uh, yeah, they're replacing you with Matt Lauer. Your agents, you know, uh, turned them off. So the next morning I called my agent before the show and he called me back and said, yeah, they're replacing you. And then I had to go out and interview Sammy Davis Jr. for an hour. And I think it's one of the best interviews I, I, I ever experienced. And he was just terrific and open and vulnerable and unpretentious, which is something to say about Sammy Davis Jr. and his narrow suits and his big metal. But people are talking that, I believe, was the best television show I ever did. If it was on the front page of the, of the Daily News or the New York Post, my producers would have that person on set that morning. I didn't have a lot of time to prep. prep but uh, the, when, remember the, the head of Nussbaum and Joel Steinberg, and there was a baby that died? We had the mother of the Steinberg baby on the show. Albert, there's something bleeding in here. What's going on? Oh, it's probably my, my microphone. Okay. All right, there it goes. Okay. All right, so and we had that. We had Bruce Cutler, John Gotti's lawyer. Nobody else had him on the air. Uh, Rosemary Henry was the producer of the show, and there, was, there were a whole bunch of other producers who were just, you know, hardworking, terrific um successful they all went on to much greater things one of them andy lasner became the producer of the executive producer of the ellen show uh others went on to work with uh, jenny jones and ricky lake and everything else so anyway eventually i was rehired with matt lauer got no believe it or not you know spontaneously matt lauer is kind of a lox uh, he's much better at reading teleprompter than I am. He's much better dressed. Even at that point, he was more handsome than I was. But when he's live, there's nothing. It's nothing. And this had a show with a live audience, and you had to work the audience, and you had to 
have the audience interact with you and interact with the guests. And uh, it, it, it wasn't his forte. So after a year, they fired Matt Lauer. They rehired me with the uh, proviso that I don't have an agent, that I come back for the same salary, that I work for a year without a contract so they could fire me at any time. So I did. And the program director who fired me, whenever he asked me to do something, I would say, picking it up here, boss, picking it up here. And he'd say, I want you to try it this way. And I go, picking it up here, boss, picking it up here. So one day he came to me and he said, why do you always say that? when I, when I tell you to do something and I said, and I, I said, Oh, it just means that I'm following your orders, but really it comes from cool hand Luke. <laughs> do you remember Strother Martin when cool hand Luke has been rearrested and brought back? He's showing all of the other prisoners that cool hand Luke is now broken. His spirit has been quashed and he's like a dog to the prison guards and he will do anything they say and whenever strother martin says luke i want you to run over there and bring the shovels over he goes picking it up here boss picking it up here and then one day he says to luke this is after months i want you to run over to that jeep there and bring me my shotgun and luke runs over grabs the shotgun just keeps running <laughs> because it was all an act. And uh, after a while, my ratings were so good that the program director couldn't do much uh, about it. And uh, I got off to Turkey to shoot a documentary. And when I came back, somebody said to me, they're changing the name to the Richard Bay show. And I said, well, thanks for asking me. That was the first I'd heard about it. Now, the other thing that happened was, you know, most of the talk shows at that time were derivative of Phil Donahue. You know, they had, they had shows where they had um, serious people, political issues, authors of books, things of consequence with some sex thrown in. People might forget Donahue always had, a, in the ratings book, had a couple of strip shows, stripper shows on you know, to, to pump up the ratings. But now, every one of the other shows, uh, the Maury and Sally and, uh, and um, even Jerry Springer, they were all doing, you know, the homeless and, the, uh, you know, other, the economy and, and, and also then throwing in some spice, which is what our formula was. And uh, we couldn't compete with them. They were all national funded shows. The budget on my show was like... Uh, the budget for Rosie O'Donnell's craft services table. Um, so one day we had a hole in our calendar. You know, we have a calendar where all the shows are lined up for the month, you know, trying to figure out where everything's going to be placed. And, and somebody had canceled and there was nothing in that spot. And one of my producers, Renee Towell, had just gotten married and she said, why don't we do a show about newlyweds? Oh, we um, you, when when you when you first get married, you have to adjust to so many things. You know, there's the they, they don't put the cap back on the toothpaste tube. There's dirty socks lying around. They they may smell differently. You got to get into bed with them. They snore at night. It's such a big adjustment. People would be interested in that. And then at the very end, we could do a version of the newlywed game. And I went, oh, this sounded awful, but we had nothing. So we had real people who were newlyweds on, and then we played the newlywed, and we called it the newlywedded game, so we wouldn't get sued. And it was a little more bawdy and raucous. The questions were, you know, a, a, a more... Uh, specific than they might be on the uh, on the new on the syndicated newlywed show and they and we had little games that were put in for them to play 
And the next day we came in and we had something like a 30 share. And our, 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 we had like double our usual ratings, over double. And I turned to the uh, producer, David Sittenfeld, and I said, real people and games. And he said, real people and games. And that's how the Richard Bay show started. So we started doing real life stories and then having games that related to those stories. And uh, the Richard Bay show, uh, we were, we were in, in slow syndication, but we were the ones starting to do that way before anybody else. Um, and with the outlandish thing, we didn't want fights on the show. We had a rule at one time, if people get up and start fighting, we cut the cameras and we go to break. So, so that wasn't our thing. But having outrageous things happen, um, you know, was the thing with people who would tell their real life stories. And I would play different characters. Producers were great too. If I was Dick Bay, Private Eye, they would get me the hat and the 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 trench coat and a pack of cigarettes to smoke while I put the Klieg light and smack people and told not really, but with the sound effect, confess that you're cheating, confess, confess. And then, uh, oh, I played a, a pirate, a big game hunter uh, on the Lion King, husbands who were lying to their wives. We had the wheel of torture. We had pies in the face. We had Judge Bay's, I had a big white wig, Judge Bay's court of no appeal. You know, way before Springer has a court show now, doesn't he? But this was, I, on my show, I would take the gavel and go, oy vey, oy vey, rather than oye, oye, which is what you do in the Supreme Court. I don't know how many people got that. But then I would tap it and I'd go, order in the court, order in the court. And then a scantily clad woman would come on and, and I'd say, I want a pastrami and rye and a side order of French fries and a Diet Coke. And she'd go, all right, that's the order from the court. <laughs> um stupid silly but that's what the show was and it was a commentary on american culture uh, of course there were so many things written richard bay this is awful that he's destroying american society and this is the bottom of the barrel well i don't want this to be too long but the show had run its course and I, and in, in the very end oh this is going to run too long in the very end, Albert, is that all right with you? Yeah, we'll we'll be okay with it. Okay. You wrap up the TV, do a little radio, and then tell us what the podcast is going to be yeah, about. Oh, great. All right, all right. So we'll get to that. Okay. So anyway, I'll skip through a couple of the other stories. That show is over. I go to WABC Radio, and uh, I'm doing politics. And even when I went there, I went, oh, my God, these people are talking politics Every day I've got, I mean, I follow politics, but I really have to catch up. So I started reading everything I could, uh, you know, in, in, the, in current events. And the station was primarily a conservative station. I came on right after uh, Rush Limbaugh, uh, Sean Hannity, and I was paired both with Steve Malsberg, a conservative, and later with Ilsa Shewolf of the SS. Um, but when the war in Iraq, I try to tell people every week, this WMD evidence, it's either fabricated, exaggerated, or it's tremendously out of date. And I can tell you that we won't find WMD, but we certainly won't find WMD based upon this evidence. And I was fired two weeks, uh, two weeks after the war began. Uh, I went on later. For holding that position? You don't I'll know. tell you this. For yeah. holding that position, Lynn Samuels, who held that position, was fired. Reverend Byron Schaefer, a, 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 a minister who was a peacenik, was on Religion Online with two other uh, hawks, a hawkish uh, rabbi and a hawkish uh, um, a Catholic priest. He was fired. So that's a yes to my question. Well, I'm saying, no, you can't, what, you can't get inside somebody's head, but you could look at this and say, look well, the evidence, happened. yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and Donahue was taken off the air, and he was told the MSNBC at the time said, if you keep Donahue on the air, you will be uh, branded as the unpatriotic channel. Uh, the Dixie Chicks had their records smashed. Right. In fact, when all that went on, I, that was so ludicrous that I brought I brought on video a videotape, and I said, Bruce Willis wants to go to war in Iraq. So I have his movie Die Hard right here, and I'm going to smash it with a hammer. Oh, I feel so good now. I've really done something, you know, to, uh, you know, to stop the war. Anyway, it was all ridiculous. I worked on WWRL. Eventually, what else? Bruno. Uh, I, that's a whole story. But I did uh, the movie Bruno with Sasha Baron Cohen. And you'll uh, share you'll share clips and you'll share other stuff yeah, yeah, from no, from no, your no. career during the podcast. Right, right, and I'll tell you the backstories. That's uh, I will tell. That's you the, the fun stuff as we go on. All right, so here is the thing. Uh, give me a banner and I'll read it off. What will this podcast be about? I'm telling you what it's been about. You can get the Richard Bay Talk live stream and podcast on Facebook at facebook.com slash facebook. No. That can't be dot com. I made a mistake there. Okay. It's only one. Slash Bay Talk. The YouTube channel, Richard Bay Talk. On Twitter, at Richard Bay Talk. There's an email. Hey, Richard Bay at gmail.com. Uh, a Richard Bay Talk podcast. Uh, and you can search for it after the thing uh, on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts. Uh, and if you subscribe... Uh, you won't miss an episode, uh, and we're going to be doing them live on Mondays. So hopefully, well, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. All right. So, mother of God, is this the end of Rico? <laughs> Ricardo Montalbay here with my Latin Equis producer Alberto Reynoso. Si, es verdad. Ah, that means yes. it's true. Well, because you know. We have to have some minority representation on this. Show. Oh, is that what I am? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> Me too. Uh, anyway, that's the story, folks. So, as I was saying, uh, you know, we could talk with each other every week. I don't want to tell you what to think. I want to just get you to think. And as I used to say... Don't let the media meld with your mind. And we'll be talking about that as well. Uh, about what's going on in our world with the media and, and what kind of herd animals they are and uh, how things change. Um, but it'll all be right here on Richard Bay Talk. Thank you so much for indulging me as I talked about myself incessantly. Um, but hopefully, we've been friends. And if not, we will become friends over the next few weeks. So take care and all my best. <laughs>